get them all caught up. So you should have just got a message that this meeting is being recorded and that's so that you can reference it later and that those who are not able to make it can also reference it. Um, so welcome everyone to Strategies and Resources for Effective and Equitable Teaching led by the Teaching and Learning Team at CTRL. I'm Hannah Jardine, I use she, her pronouns, one of the Teaching and Learning Specialists and also an adjunct professor for the School of Education, not this semester, but have taught as an adjunct in previous semesters. And I'll let my colleagues introduce themselves, starting with Mac. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Matt Kreit. I use they them pronouns and I am also a teaching and learning specialist. I have not adjunct at um, American yet, but I have at other institutions and my disciplinary background is in virology, so the study of viruses. And I'll, uh, Shed, go ahead. Hi everyone, my name is Shed, like the thing in your backyard. I go by she or they pronouns, either is fine. Um, I'm a teaching and learning specialist here, but also I adjunct in sociology in the College of Arts and Sciences, and I'll pass it to Mary Catherine. Hi, my name is Mary Catherine. Um, I also use she, her pronouns, and um, I work as an adjunct uh, in the Performing Arts Department in the College of Arts and Sciences. Um, my background is in ethnomusicology, so I will hand it back to Hannah. Welcome, everyone. Um, tonight, uh, we have a few guidelines for participation for you all. Um, so throughout this workshop, throughout this session tonight, we kindly ask that you make yourself comfortable, especially at this point in the evening. If you're eating dinner, uh, we welcome that. If you need to stim, rock, fidget, knit, craft, et cetera, to, to stay with us, um, just make yourself comfortable. Be present so we will have opportunities for you to um, do some self-reflection, do some engagement in the chat, even talk to each other. I think we have a pretty small group here, so um, we'll have plenty of time for you to talk through any questions or ideas that you have. So feel free to, as it mentions here, ask questions or share ideas in the chat or use the raise hand function to speak under the reactions and certainly be generous with your knowledge and respectful of others' knowledge. So we're gonna start with some introductions um, in the chat, if you could introduce yourself, maybe what department you're teaching in or what school and share, what are you most excited about when it comes to teaching at AU this semester? Hi, um, I'm Catherine. Um, I'm very excited because um, I got my master's degree at American University and as a, you know, PhD student where you sort of have those um, like insecurities and I'm trying to build and grow through those. It was really just so amazing and circular to be invited back to teach. Um, and so I'm just really excited to sort of step into this role as I am trying to continue to affirm myself in academia as a neurodivergent in academia. Excellent. Thank you for sharing, Catherine. Yeah, and feel free. If others want to share out loud, we welcome that as well, or share in the chat. Um, we have multiple options for participation here. And we'll talk about um, the benefits of that later in the session. Hi there. How's everyone? Hey. Hey, my name is Vincent Schuler. I am uh, going to be an adjunct for the first time here at American. I'll be in JLC teaching a, a justice and law and criminology class, um, intro to justice systems. Um, in my day job, I am a federal prosecutor for the Department of Justice. I've been a lawyer for 17 years. I'm a retired military. I used to be in the JAG Corps. And once upon a time, I used to teach Army lawyers. Um, I haven't taught since then. It's been a few years. And uh, this is my way of sort of giving back to the profession. I know a lot of these uh, JLC students are aspiring lawyers. And so I feel like if I um, come back and teach, they'll be able to get some exposure to someone who is a lawyer and get sort of some practical perspectives on the law. So it's my way of giving back. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. That yeah, seems like based on what's coming up in the chat and what you all are sharing, there's a combination of people who 
did their graduate work at AU, which is really awesome to see you coming back to give back, or like you said, Vincent, giving back in a way to bring your professional connections to your teaching here. Um, and that's what is so amazing about uh, this opportunity of teaching as an adjunct. You often have several different experiences to draw from to bring to the classroom and the students really appreciate that. All right, so thank you all for those introductions. Um, so throughout this session, our goals for you today and what we've put together here for you is um, a session that by the end, you will be able to integrate strategies to make your teaching more effective, engaging and equitable, identify relevant teaching support resources and opportunities to engage with us, the CTRL teaching and learning team. So that'll be more towards the end where we'll go over all the different ways in which um, we're here to support you. And then uh, like what we just started with the introductions, our goal here is also to create a space where you can connect with fellow instructors and start building community and a support system uh, for your first semester teaching here. So this session is really uh, focused around the idea of inclusive and equitable teaching, and we'll work throughout the session to define all of these things with you, but wanted to start with this quote from uh, this book, What Inclusive Instructors Do, that inclusive teaching involves designing learning environments that are equitable, where all students have the opportunity to reach their potential and welcoming, and that they foster a sense of belonging. So this really frames um, those key foundational principles that we will uh, base everything we're presenting in this session around. Um, so to get some ideas before we get into the details about what those words mean and how to do that in the classroom, um, and then do another quick interactive exercise with you all to get your thoughts on what your goals might be for this semester. So um, this we're going to practice using the annotation tool in Zoom. So if any of you are teaching on Zoom, you might use this in your classroom. Um, or if you're teaching in person, you could also set up something like this on a whiteboard or a chalkboard. Uh, but if everybody could add one or more words to the board to complete the sentence, I believe that blank is important in teaching today. And to access the annotation tool, you should see at the top of your screen, view options. Um, and then if you click that and then go to annotate and choose text, you can type a response. It might look, the text looks like a, a T. Maybe some of my colleagues could start modeling and then uh, we'll catch on. So really, you can put your words anywhere in that white space on the board. So I see, yeah, flexibility, trust. And let me know if, um, if people need help finding the tool. Wouldn't be surprised if with Zoom updates, it's different than when we created these directions. But Yeah, I, I don't see view options. Hi, hello, uh, me neither. This is Vito. Hi, um, if you, at the top of the viewing window, it might say something in green that says, you are viewing Hannah Jardine's screen. And then next to that, it says view options. You might have to hover over the top portion of your Zoom screen to find it. I see it, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Lindsay. As the host, I'm not sure what others see. That's helpful. All right, so now I see some words coming in. Again, throughout this session, we'll model different strategies that you could use in teaching, whether you're in person or online. So something like this could be a great warm up um, for your students. You could give them a sentence like this and ask them to fill in a blank, either out loud or on a whiteboard or on post-it notes or um, just turning and talking to the person next to them. And we gave you an opportunity here to kind of engage collaboratively without having to speak, which is another benefit um, for those who maybe are really excited to share their ideas, but not necessarily to raise their hand and speak out loud in front of the class. So what we see here, I got on the screen, um, I believe that acceptance is important, compassion, adaptability, empathy, exchange, flexibility, investment, listening, trust. See some kind of themes across here a lot more these humanistic words that have become more and more, um, we've become more and more aware of throughout the last few years of teaching. 
So I'm also going to, with the benefit of this annotation feature, I can save a screenshot of what you all are writing and then share it with you later on so that we have record of that. All right, so that is saved and I'm going to continue on. So thank you for sharing your ideas. Are you just doing a screenshot on your own uh, computer or is that a Zoom tool? So for as the host, when I open up the annotation bar and I click the annotation feature, there's something on there that allows me to download and then it'll save either as a picture or a PDF, essentially a screenshot of uh, what's on the screen. Um, you could do the typical, I guess, screenshot, the shift command, whatever the buttons are and take a screenshot of your screen, but Zoom also builds that in when you're when you're doing annotation that you can save that. Real quick, um, you can also save it as a participant. So uh, oh. you should be able to see it on your annotation toolbar right under the um, clear button. No, I am a host. Never mind. JK, ignore me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I thought you could. I do see a save button, but it's only on the expanded navigation. And um, I'm not a host, so I think you're right. We learn something new every day. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, um, yeah. So thank you again for sharing all of those words. And I think over the last few years, a lot of these same words that we had pre-programmed into this um, presentation you all shared as well. So over the last few years, we've learned about the importance of a lot of these things like clarity, transparency, empathy. I know that was a word that was shared. Uh, empowerment, belonging, that was a word that was shared. Flexibility, I think was shared. Connection, engagement, compassion. Um, so seeing some themes here. So we've gotten better at doing these things. Um, and we've known since well before the last few years and before the pandemic, our aspects of equitable and inclusive teaching um, so these are what we aim for as teachers and learners at AU. And we would call this in aspects of a student-centered learning experience where we're really thinking about um, putting the students and their um, needs and preferences forefront when we're thinking about designing our instruction. So rather than designing around content and what are all of the ideas I need to um, move forward with, it's what do students need? What do I want students to gain from this course? Um, what do I want the students' experience to be? What do I want them to learn? So if we're thinking about centering students, uh, what, how can we approach that, right? So we could go into detail in regards to any of the words on the previous slide, but to frame the rest of the workshop and to give you kind of uh, a memorable set of words that you can refer back to throughout the semester as you're teaching, we're gonna focus on three Cs, clarity, compassion, and connection. So clarity being related to transparency or structure, compassion related to flexibility and empathy and considering the whole student, social, emotional well-being, and then connection, um, thinking about engagement and interaction and how to keep students actively involved in their learning. So all these things being aspects of inclusive pedagogy associated with higher achievement, especially for students from marginalized groups. So throughout the rest of this session, I'm gonna pass it off to my three different colleagues to go into these in more detail. Uh, we're gonna give you a lot of options for strategies that might uh, make sense for you, might make sense for your courses. Some of them might not. Um, so please note, we'll give, be giving you a lot of options and choose what works for you. Um, and um, you know, keep some of them in your back pocket for the future. So before we get into the details about the three C's, we'll just check in really quickly and pause for a quick individual reflection. So we'd love to hear from you in the chat or if somebody would like to speak out loud, we welcome that as well. Which of these three C's is resonating most with you and why? Hi, Catherine, again. Um, for me, I actually suggested the word compassion, um, which has been something that I have tried to bring with me. I've actually been teaching for about um, four years now, five years um, at uh, the State University in New York where I'm where I'm doing my PhD. 
And I find compassion has been something really key to me in creating relationships with my students because far too often when I was a student, um, a lot of instructors fail to keep in mind as a first generation student, I had four jobs. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there was, I, I had a lot of demands on my time. My senior year, I was taking care of my grandmother who was ill. And so there are times when a professor needs to be um, flexible to understand schedules and to be um, not so crazy about due dates, to have a flexible, to have flexibility as a matter of policy that students understand. I don't need to be afraid and have a pit in my stomach to talk to this person about needing an extension or I didn't come to class a couple days in a row, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. And I think what I'm hearing in there too is ideas about just transparency, honesty, openness, um, mutual respect and understanding of each other's circumstances and how important that is to create that space for learning. And I think that resonates a lot with what others are saying in the chat. Um, clarity of expectations. And I think... Um, it might be challenging, you know, to pick one of these three C's, right, and which one resonates because they are so all, are also interconnected, not mutually exclusive by any means. I'm noticing in the way people are describing their interpretation of connection that also overlaps with compassion as well as clarity. So, um, as we go through these and the strategies related to them, you'll see some overlaps and some connections between that. So I'm going to pass it to. Uh, shed, I believe, for to get us started with clarity. All right. Uh, thanks, Hannah. So we're going to talk about why clarity is important in teaching, which we, we've already started to talk about a little bit in the chat and over video. So our working memories are not infinite. We can't hold everything in our brains all at once all the time. And so it's important clarity for one reason is because it helps us reduce cognitive overload, help our students focus on what they're supposed to be doing and how they can do it well, rather than ha them having to spend energy guessing, trying to figure things out, assuming, and then you having to answer questions about it, right? So when we give students that clarity, it helps them understand the how and the why behind your instructional decision. So why am I completing this assignment? And what am I supposed to be getting from it? And how do I do a good job on this assignment? How can I turn it in and know that I've done well? So we also like to refer to the hidden curriculum. And let me know in the chat if you've ever heard that term before. But when we're talking about hidden curriculum, we mean these sort of unspoken rules of higher education, these unspoken um, sort of um, standards or agreements that we sort of have. Um, like for example, when should you go to office hours or uh, should you raise your hand in class before speaking? These are all rules that might seem obvious to, uh, you know, from, from an outside perspective, but our students don't necessarily know those things. Um, we don't know what their backgrounds are and how experienced they are with a higher education setting. And so we have to clarify those things for them. So for example, what does good participation look like in this class? Do you raise your hand? Do you just speak? Are you not supposed to, you know, speak until you're in a, in a think pair share or a small group? We need to clarify that for them. And then when should they visit office hours? Some students might assume that if you go to office hours, you're in trouble. And some might say, oh, you should go all the time because that shows that you're a committed student. So you have to let students know because it's going to vary from class to class. And so we want our students to be aware of how to um, engage well. Uh, clarity sh is shown in research to increase students' academic confidence, so they feel more confident about the work that they're doing. They feel more of that sense of self-efficacy, like they can accomplish things they take on. They in it increases students' mastery of skills, so they're better able to pick up different practices or new skills in the class. And then, of course, their overall academic performance, by which this means grades. Um, so I think we're ready for the next slide. 
Thank you. Um, so let's talk about clarity and structure then. So, you know, we know it's important. So how do we enact it? So having a clear structure and organization for our courses will support student success. So here are some ways that we can put it into action. We can send regular reminders to our students, such as weekly announcements or to-do lists with deadlines and requirements. Students have a lot on their plates, their plates just like we do, and having some reminders can be really helpful and help orient them towards whatever you're focusing on or whatever your goal is for this week or this lesson. You could share an agenda or outline for each class session to help students stay, again, focused on what you're supposed to be accomplishing and so they know what they're going to be practicing that day. You could follow a consistent weekly rhythm. Students tell us when we conduct feedback surveys that they love, love, love this. They love when things are due always at the same time or on the same day, right? That consistency is really great. Um, creating a simple structure for organizing materials in Canvas. Um, so having modules set up, having a syllabus very clearly posted like on the main page of your Canvas course. This is something that we can talk about more, though we are not experts on Canvas. Um, there are ways that you can use Canvas to be a little more intuitive for you. And we really recommend using the student view on Canvas. That will really help you see it from the student's view. And of course, be clear about your expectations for all assignments and activities, whether they are a huge, you know, the end of semester assignment or just like a weekly minute paper or exit ticket from class. So um, a quick reminder here before we talk more about that sort of clarity and assignments is that these are also um, Part of the some of the strategies that would constitute a trauma-informed approach. And so trauma-informed teaching is really important, especially considering, right, we know our students are going to come to our classrooms with some type or varying types of trauma in their lives. And so practicing transparency, consistency, um, those are actually really important parts of the trauma-informed approach. And if you want to read more, we've linked a really great article about trauma-informed teaching at the bottom of this slide. All right. So applying transparent assignment design. So how do we how do we bring transparency to the assignments we give to students? Well, you can use the model of tilt or transparent assign, assignment design by following, including these three qualities, the purpose, the task, and the criteria for the assignment. So the purpose is the value of the assignment. Uh, why are we doing this? What are we supposed to get out of it? How is this assignment supporting my learning? And how is it connected to the learning outcomes? You also include the tasks, so the components, the due dates, what are they turning in, what are they supposed to include, or what do I need to do for this assignment? And then criteria, so your expectations for evaluation, for example, a rubric, a checklist, um, a grading, whatever sort of scheme. So students may ask, how do I know whether I have been successful with this assignment? We don't want students to feel surprised by the grades that they get on their work. We want them to understand the assignment clearly enough that they have a pretty good idea of what their grade is going to be like when they get it back. So clarifying things like the criteria will help students know whether they're fulfilling all of the requirements of the assignment before they turn it in. And thank you for sharing that, Mary Catherine. Yeah, Mary Catherine has shared the uh, Carlo and Butler article in the chat, which is a great article. Um, anything that my colleagues want to add here before we move forward? All right. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> and, um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> and this is Mac. Um, so I'm taking the next section. Um, so we're going to talk about compassion next. And just before we get into it, I'll note um, that we will be sharing all of our materials with you all afterwards. Um, so we'll share links, of course, in the chat, but we will also You'll also get a full copy of this PowerPoint, which will have all of the links embedded in it um, so that you can access anything that you need afterwards. So compassion, let's talk about compassion. So a lot of you uh, mentioned which C stood out to you the most, and a lot of you mentioned that it was compassion. And we even had compassion come up on our initial um, annotation board. So clearly compassion is really important and it's key to equitable teaching. So compassion can center around uh, the idea of being aware of and recognizing and treating students as people with lives outside of the classroom, right? 
It includes meeting students where they are and being compassionate to both them and yourself. So as we talk through this short section, um, we uh, we recognize that all of us, including you as instructors, have been through a lot recently. Um, I could name all of the things that we've been through, but I think that would take another two hour session. Um, but that being said, uh, promoting flexibility, trust, compassion, and grace within our classrooms can help us promote equitable teaching and learning environments, as well as those high standards that a lot of us are working towards. So why is compassion com important? Um, compassion is key to uh, being equitable, welcoming, and respectful in the class. It helps to cultivate a positive classroom climate, which then increases students' sense of belonging, motivation, and overall academic performance. So when we create these positive classroom climates or classroom environments, students know that they're supported and this increases their ability to learn. They know that they can make mistakes. They know that they can come to you. They know who they're able to ask questions of and who they're able to get assistance from. And that lets them learn better and also make mistakes and take uh, risks that they may not be able to take in other classrooms. We can also have deeper, more meaningful and more rigorous conversations and discussions with our students when we create these positive spaces. Um, those conversations are much more difficult to have happen in spaces where students don't feel comfortable or they don't feel like they have a compassionate instructor because they may maybe they're wary of you as an instructor or of their fellow classmates or they're nervous to speak and participate in class. And so if they're nervous and wary, you're not going to have great discussions. So if we're able to promote that compassion, um, then we're able to have just essentially better classrooms. So now uh, what I wanna do is I wanna highlight a quote from uh, one of our student partners. So the student partners is a new program that we've started at CTRL um, where we work with undergraduate uh, students who are uh, really engaged in teaching and they uh, create uh, really cool projects at the beginning and at the end of their time as student partners. And so this is a quote from one of the uh, set of student partners. And I see your question, Vito, so just let me get through this quote and then I'll, uh, I'll take it. Um, so this quote is from uh, Reba Matthews and Kamaya Parker Hill. And it states, we hope to encourage a classroom culture that follows an etiquette of care and respect for both the educator and students. This culture requires an inclusive framework and a conscientious approach to student learning. It is impo important that both students and educators take accountability for their own learning while also providing opportunities for that learning to happen. All right, uh, and Vito, you have a question? Yes, <clears throat> thanks. Um, so I was wondering, like considering what Sansi you said in the previous slide, um, how to encourage students to participate. Because I was thinking that, you know, I would say that statistically, it's always the case that you have, you know, some students, a few students that will always be engaged and want to ask questions and that we raise their hands and others that might have lots of questions or comments, but for, you know, any reason, they don't feel comfortable to raise their hand. So I was thinking, what would you suggest to do to encourage people, you know, to, to participate in that sense, to try to you know, uh, help or assist people that are less, you know, like prone to, 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 to raise their hand and speak in front of a class of maybe 20, 25 people to try also to engage them as well, especially, you know, yeah. just because I, for example, I put in my syllabus and evaluation that, you know, class participation is part of the mark. It's like 20% of the mark mm -hmm. is also class participation. So, you know, you, you I also don't want them to, to to give a better mark to those that just have, you know, the, the, the have that kind of like extrovert character that that allows them to to raise their hand and then penalize those that instead maybe are more introvert. Absolutely, that and that's a great question. So I'll note here that that question is the subject of an entire. That could be an entire course, right? In uh, incorporating alternative modes of participation, allowing students different ways to participate and encouraging that participation. So I can give you kind of a surface level answer here, um, but I do encourage you, and we'll talk a little bit about this at the end, we have a consultation service. So if you're interested in talking more about that with one of our teaching and learning team members, we're always happy to talk about uh, promoting and assessing participation. 
So initially, just to get at your question, um, one of the best options that you have is really defining what you mean by participation. So if you have participation as a part of your syllabus, you need it's it's really important to lay out in terms of clarity and transparency what participation looks like in class. And so you'd mentioned, you know, speaking up in class, that's a very typical way that a lot of people think about participation. But there are other ways to participate, such as asking good questions or um, engaging in small group discussions, or maybe even just taking notes and being very uh, participatory in their sitting as they're in class. Um, maybe it's engaging with the material outside of class. That's another way that students can participate. So the first thing that I would suggest then is to clarify and define what you mean by participation and what kind of counts as participation. You could also try doing this in co collaboration with students, um, but that's that's one thing to do. And then the second thing that I'll note is that um, offering choice and alternative modes to participate. So like you mentioned, and I think like a lot of us think, the main way that students uh, typically think about that participation is when they speak up, they raise their hand and they speak in class, right? But there are lots of other ways that students can participate in class, such as, like I said, those small group discussions, you could have, um, you know, a digital form. If you're teaching in person, maybe there's a way that students can respond where they don't have to speak. So, um, you know, so we use the annotation feature here. You could have them write their responses on a whiteboard. You could have students respond to a prompt uh, by writing like a short reflection on their own that they don't necessarily have to read out. That's the minute paper that Shed mentioned earlier. Um, there's also there's there's hundreds and and like so many different ways. I'm uh, it's it's a little hard to just pull out a few, um, but I'll note that Mary Catherine put in the uh, chat our resource on uh, student participation. So that talks about some of the ways that you can pr uh, promote student participation as well as assess it equitably in a way that doesn't just prioritize those students that are extroverts and much more willing to speak out. Um, yeah, Catherine, go Thanks ahead. Thanks a lot. Yeah, and if you if you do want to continue the conversation, I we are always happy to chat more about participation. It's it's difficult and it, it's hard to do right. Yeah, no, I, I understand. I mean, I also, you know, of course, I made just the example of raising hand and speaking in front of the class, just because that's the most obvious example in a in a way. But I, for example, I also plan in you know each class to have small group exercises, you know, as far as possible that you know I explain something and then. I give them the opportunity to discuss for two minutes and then, you know, like those who want can speak or, or to work in, in larger groups and all that. So like definitely point taken. Okay. And uh, Catherine, did you still have a question? Um, just a comment very quickly, because I know that you <clears throat> need to get through your presentation, Max. So thank you. Um, I just wanted to mention to Vito, there is a technology called Pear Deck, P-E-A-R-D-E-C-K. Um, which is an online technology that you can use to connect to your slideshow so that students can type into a private window that will populate on your computer if they would prefer to type a question rather than say something out loud. Cool. Thank you for sharing that, Catherine. I haven't heard of that uh, technology, but we'll have to we'll have to look into it. All right. So yeah, Hannah, go ahead to the next slide. Um, so let's let's talk briefly about some of the ways that we can actually demonstrate care and compassion. So we talked about some of these. So we often we talked about choice slightly when we when it comes to participation. Um, but let's talk about some of those other things. So one of the things that you can really do is be aware of your students' practicalities. So the fact that they have lives and commitments outside of uh, class. Across the US, research shows that about 30% of undergraduate students have a full-time job and about 70% of graduate students. So a lot of our students have additional responsibilities that they have outside of class. Additionally, about 30-ish percent of students are full-time caregivers for parent, children, uh, grandparents, whatever. So there are a lot of different uh, practicalities that students will have outside of class. So how do we become aware of our students' practicalities? One option is uh, encouraging one-on-one -on -one meetings during office hours early in the semester. This can also lower that barrier to office hour attendance and let them know, hey, it's okay to come to office hours. I want you here. I want you to come to my office hours. 
Um, you could also try uh, having a survey at the beginning of class. So this is a great way to get a sense of their students and their situations. So you can ask things like, what's your name? What pronouns do you use? What year are you? But you can also ask maybe more uh, leading or more uh, deep questions like, is there anything in your learning environment that I should be aware about? And so I usually ask that question to my students and I get a huge range of responses to that. I'll get students saying, I am just so excited for this class, but I'll also get students who disclose homelessness or that they have ADHD, but they don't have accommodations for that. And so when I hear that from my students, um, it helps me learn more about them and adjust the course to make it slightly uh, more tailored to our students. And once I'm finished speaking, I will uh, share a link to the survey that I uh, typically send out to my students so that you all can pull from it if you'd like. Also note that, uh, again, just explicitly stating to students that you're there to support them is really important. You could have an empathy or a mental health statement on your syllabus. Um, one that I have used in the past is uh, basically, quote, life happens and challenges may arise for any of us during the semester. Uh, my role is to support you while still holding you to high standards of performance and professionalism. Please reach out to me as soon as you can if you need assistance or exceptions. So that's again saying, I know life happens, I know things will come up, but let me know. I need you to communicate with me so that we can figure out a way forward. We can offer choice and flexibility where possible. That also increases student buy-in. So perhaps on particular assignments, student can, students can choose particular topics, or maybe they can choose to write an essay, give a presentation, or do something slightly more creative. We can also think about due date and attendance flexibility. So in terms of uh, offering extensions or offering students the opportunity to not attend every class. Um, and then finally, we can be transparent with our policies and why they are the way we are. Sometimes policies, we have to have particular policies like grades have to be in by a certain day. So we have a, a specific deadline for when our extensions have to end. And that's OK. But as long as students know why that is the case, they are able to have a little bit more buy-in. Um, and you can also ask them for feedback on some of your policies or practices, which again, can increase their buy-in and adherence to some of those policies. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Mary Catherine to talk about uh, connection. Thanks, Mac. Um, yeah, so the last of these three of our trifecta is connection. Um, you can go to the next slide. So starting with why it's important, connection could mean a number of different things. What we're referring to here is the student's connection to the content, the student's connection to the instructor, and the student's connection to each other. Um, a combination of all of these types of connections increases student engagement and active participation, which leads to deeper processing and understanding. Connections improve students' critical thinking, problem solving, collaboration, and creativity. Um, so another student quote here that we have from one of our um, student partners highlights how important connections are to our students. Um, Nathaniel Smith says that students learn differently. No one learner consumes knowledge and information um, the same way. If students are not given the opportunity to engage in dialogue, ask questions, or share their own ideas and perspectives, then their learning and development in that classroom is limited. So really about getting to know our students and their unique ways of engaging with the material that we're presenting. There are so many ways that you can increase student connections to your content. So we're gonna go through a few of them. Um, Let's talk for a moment about what happens during class when you're uh, introducing content through a more, more traditional lecture. That doesn't hurt learning, but students learn better when they're actively engaged during the lecture. So um, whether it's online, hybrid, or in person, there are a number of ways you can monitor your students' understanding of content and keep them focused. So you can use polls at the beginning and end of class or any point in the middle. You can use reactions um, like on Zoom, the thumbs up, thumbs down, that sort of thing, or in person, <laughs> thumbs up, thumbs down. Um, you can use directed paraphrasing where you stop at any point and have students um, paraphrase a concept to a partner, to themselves, out loud or in writing. You can pause and reflect. Um, you can ask your students to pause and reflect on any number of things that you're presenting. What we've been modeling throughout this session is that pause and reflect where we stop 
in certain places? And have you reflect, review, summarize, think about the application, connect it to your own experiences, all that sort of thing. Um, online, you can have them do it in the chat or um, in person, you can, again, like have them talk to each other or pick a few to have uh, share out loud. And then the last thing we have here is this individual quick write um, where you might use it as a warm up, you might use it as a closure exercise, um, but just having students take like one to five minutes, depending on whether they're used to doing this in class and also how big the question you're asking is, but it's just having them warm up for the class or again, reflect as a closure on one, um, one prompt you give them. Um, so building connections with your students as the instructor is also critical. So you can build connections with your students by recognizing and integrating, integrating their identities and differences into the course by getting to know them and letting them make choices about content and assessments. Um, one way to empower them is to provide opportunities for co-creation, such as collaboratively choosing content, developing classroom norms together, or creating rubrics together. Um, ask students what matters to them and what they want to learn. Start of semester surveys, um, like the one that Mac, I think, just shared is a great place to start getting to know your students. You can also ask students for their feedback, especially on how you are working, how things are working for them in the course, and apply that feedback. So whenever you ask for feedback, you want to apply it and tell students why you're applying it, what you're applying, maybe why you're not applying certain things that semester. Um, you can leave time for these types of questions at the end of class or send out an anonymous survey um, at the beginning of the course. Again, you can ask what's working for them so you can apply it throughout the rest of the course. Um, but any time you check in throughout the course can be productive. The last um, element of this that we'll talk about today is the students to student interactions and collaborations um, is a huge part of connection and effective inclusive teaching. Social connections motivate students and provide opportunities for deeper learning. In person or remote, you can use Google Docs, the Zoom whiteboard, um, like the annotation feature we were just using. And there's also a Zoom whiteboard, which is a little more extensive, I think, with the tools it has. Um, and there's other technology and tools like this Pear Deck um, to support student collaboration, give students a chance to share ideas in writing as well as out loud. I guess the Pear Deck is more between the instructor and the student. But um, so another, another thing you can do other than this technology stuff is low stakes in class work, um, small group work, uh, breakout rooms can foster connections as students all contribute their understandings and experiences. You can do this through like short case studies, concept mapping. There's a lot of activities you can have students do that if you don't want them just to talk um, to each other, you know, over and over again. You can have students conduct a peer review process in which you create a structure for students to, and provide them with so that they can provide each other with actionable supportive feedback. Um, and then the classic think pair share. So that's a, a bit more informal and can happen pretty quickly. This graphic demonstrates um, at the bottom right how a think pair share works. So you ask students to think on their own about a question related to the course content, then talk in pairs or small groups, potentially in a breakout room if you're on Zoom, and then talk in a larger group or with the whole class um, after they've had a chance to share their ideas in the small groups. So this strategy helps students form ideas um, in a sort of safer setting where they're not speaking in front of everyone. And that helps them build confidence. It also ensures that all students have a chance to talk about the course idea, even if they'd rather not speak in front of the whole class. So this is a really easy one to incorporate with just a few minutes during the lecture. And I will pass it back to Mac. Hey folks, this is Mac again. Um, so as you all know, because you were right there, um, we just went through a ton of ideas and a lot of strategies um, that you can use in a student-centered classroom to try and strive for this clarity, connection, and compassion with your students. So we were originally going to do a short chat check-in right now, um, but I think in order to allow you all to have uh, quite a bit of time to talk to one another, we will move that chat check-in to uh, a question that you can answer in your breakout rooms as you talk to one another. So we were initially gonna ask you, how are you thinking differently about the three Cs? 
but um, we're going to offer you the opportunity to respond to this question uh, as you talk with your colleagues. So Hannah, if you could go to the next slide. Great. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to put you into small breakout rooms um, and just let you have a short conversation with your uh, with your peers. So I'll ask you um, to think about uh, how you're thinking differently about those three C's. Which of the strategies might you try this semester and what impact do you think it'll have on your students as well as on you? Um, and then you can also think about what makes you feel included in a learning space and how you can recre recreate that for your students. We've put a few uh, norms at the bottom of this slide. So listen actively, make space for all to share and be open-minded. Just as a reminder, as you move into those breakout rooms that we're hoping to create these equitable spaces for you all as instructors as well. Um, so with that, uh, before we- I have we... the rooms ready, yeah. That's what I was gonna ask. I was just gonna ask, uh, are the rooms ready? And does anyone have any questions before we move you all into the rooms? All right. All right. So you'll have about 10 minutes in the rooms. All right, welcome back everyone. Thanks for talking in your rooms. I'm gonna invite you, um, if you have a takeaway that you would like to share, to go ahead and share that in the chat. So something that you talked about in your room or something that you uh, realized or shared with one another, please feel free to share that in the chat. We would love to read it. Um, in the meantime, I think we'll keep moving um, with our presentation if that sounds good. So we're going to start talking about some of these inclusive strategies or sort of these concepts of DEIJ, diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice, um, with this quote from what inclusive instructors do. Inclusive instruction is teaching that recognizes and affirms a student's social identity as an important influence on teaching and learning processes. It works to disrupt traditional notions of who succeeds in the classroom and the systemic inequities inherent in traditional educational practices. So to sort of break this one down, um, uh, what we appreciate here is that Addie is pointing out that um, identity, student identity, instructor identity um, is not an accessory or sort of a, an add on to teaching. It's central to our teaching and learning experiences. And so inclusive instruction means recognizing the role that identity plays in education and acknowledging it and working with it instead of perhaps trying to circumvent it. So instead of, you know, sort of uh, ignoring those facets of identity and sort of keeping the same sort of groups uh, successful in education, we can intervene on that and address some of those inequities. And so let's talk about what that looks like. What are some actions that we take to make that real? And I love that, Susan. Thank you for sharing. So there are a lot of frameworks <laughs> about teaching and learning, including those about equity in one way or another or inclusiveness. And so you could see we've sort of got equitable teaching, the sort of concept of it in the center here. And then a lot of really relevant frameworks that are sort of intertwined or that borrow from one another or share concepts. So we've already mentioned trauma-informed pedagogy. Um, we're going to talk about universal design for learning or UDL, and we're going to intertwine some different aspects of things like active learning, anti-racist pedagogy, um, differentiated learning. So not that we have to learn every single one of these, but rather we're going to, um, to achieve equitable teaching or to work towards it. We're going to combine strategies that sort of overlap in all of these different frameworks. 
All right. So what do we mean by these terms then? Let's distinguish them from one another. Diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. So you probably have heard these terms a lot of times and you may have heard them um, used interchangeably, right? As if they have the same meaning. Uh, what we're going to do is offer you one tool for defining or distinguishing these terms from one another. So it's not an absolute definition or anything. It's just how we define these terms. And we invite you to uh, use this spectrum to sort of understand. Uh, D E I J or D I E J. So uh, here is the spectrum that we're working with, and it ranges from diversity to justice, with it becoming sort of scaffolded, building on one another. So inclusion builds on diversity, equity builds on inclusion and diversity, um, in terms of sort of the least action or commitment, all the way to justice being the most action and commitment and strategies. So let's break these down into different statements that represent how we enact them at AU. So for diversity, we are recognizing difference that exists at AU. It can be captured in a statement like, there are many different people, perspectives, and identities at AU. So that's just noticing that there is diversity. There is there's, uh, different types of people coexisting in the space of AU. But that's not really an action we take. It's more of recognizing difference. Whereas inclusion builds on that recognition of difference to try and welcome people in to have a sense of belonging as part of the group. So inclusion can be represented by a statement like, we invite valid, rational, non-dominant people, perspectives, or identities at AU, sort of into the conversation or into the community. So inclusion is going beyond just recognizing that there's difference and trying to incorporate folks into a sense of belonging and community at AU. Then if we want to build on that, we would even move to equity. So equity is not just recognizing difference at AU. It's not just trying to include across difference at AU, but it is addressing biases that lead to the dominance or invisibility of different people perspective, per, excuse me, perspectives or identities at AU. So here with equity, we are recognizing that power, resources, opportunity is unequitably distributed to people on the basis of their identity. And we're trying to correct that in a way. So we are seeing, right, that some of our students are going to have less access because of things outside of their control, right, related to their identity. How can we sort of correct that and redistribute resources? And then building even on that, we have justice. So justice then is not just recognizing difference with diversity, welcoming across different difference with inclusion or redistributing resources on the basis of equity, but justice is taking a sort of meta step back, a big step back and asking, why is there inequity? Why do some folks have less access to resources? Why do some people deal with certain discrimination uh, in our community? So justice comes with this statement, we challenge policies that reinforce the dominance or invisibility of people's perspectives and identities at AU. So sort of looking at the systems that create inequity in the first place and trying to address that. So if we want to represent these in sort of simpler, just a couple words, um, on our next slide here, uh, we can say diversity is acknowledging difference. Inclusion is including across difference. Equity is trying to make up for a lack of resources that it's assigned due to difference. And then justice is challenging the systems which make some difference sort of uh, more privileged than others. So I'll give you a teaching example, which would be homelessness and student uh, housing insecurity. Um, I actually read a study today that in 2020, 58% um, of students in the US surveyed had dealt with some form of food or housing insecurity that year, which is shocking, more than half, right? Um, and unfortunately makes some sense with 2020 being that the year that it was um that that was reported so but it continues right we know that there is homelessness it's a huge issue among our student populations including at AU there's going to be homeless students or students struggling with housing at AU so if we were going to take a diversity approach to it we would say there are homeless students here and that's sort of it, right? It's the acknowledgement of that difference. If we want those students to feel welcomed, included a sense of belonging, we move to inclusion. And perhaps we educate about you, the, the topic. We try to have events that are welcoming to our students who are dealing with housing insecurity, um, try to uh, make those students feel like part of the community. 
But if we want to address the lack of resources that our homeless students are struggling with, then we would move to equity. And we would try to acknowledge, right, or do something about that inequity that exists. So um, things like the financial barrier students face, can they afford the textbook? Can they afford the next meal that they're having? So as teachers, to take an equity approach, we could make our texts low cost or no cost. Um, we can find ways for students to access, you know, like an ebook. Um, we could make sure cost plays no role in students succeeding in the class because there's already plenty of financial barriers for our students to succeed. Then if we move on to justice beyond that, we're just asking, so we're not just doing that, but we're asking why are there students who are homeless here? Why are there students who can't afford their next meal at AU? And what are the policies or systems that create that and how can we change those? So that's just one example, and there's a lot to talk about here, um, but what we want to ask you to do now is to reflect on how you feel within the spectrum. So we're going to do another annotation activity. So once again, you should see something that says a little green bar, at least this is what I see, that says you're viewing Hannah Jardine's screen, and next to it is view options, and you can select annotate. And then there are little stamps. So there is a check mark you can click on, and then there's all different symbols like a heart, a question mark, a star. And I'm going to ask you to go ahead and use the stamp tool to mark where you feel your teaching falls on this spectrum. Where do you feel most comfortable or familiar? And there is no right answer because it's going to be different for all of us. So go ahead and add whatever stamp you like. I'm seeing some around equity, which is Awesome. Feel free to use the shape that speaks to you. So it's the stamp one, the fourth one down for me. The drawing tool is temperamental. I had many disagreements with it. Oh, excellent. Okay, this looks wonderful. So, okay, I see a lot around inclusion, equity, and justice, which is so beautiful. And so we're going to represent a range. And maybe in some aspects of your teaching, you feel like, oh, in syllabus design, I feel like I'm very equitable. But my activities, maybe I'm more on the inclusion side. Uh, this is an ongoing process. We're always trying to move towards justice. We're always trying to get better and be more equitable instructors, more, more justice focused. And so it's going to be a process for us um, that's always going on. We're always getting better at it. So uh, thank you for annotating. I'm going to save it as a PNG. Why not? And then I'm going to clear it. And I'm going to pass it over to Mac to talk about how we are going to activate this knowledge with classroom strategies. So one of our options we have, right? So we want to try and move further right with our um, with our strategies, or maybe that's a goal for some of us, maybe some of us feel okay where we're at. But one thing that we wanna offer you is this idea of a plus one strategy. So I'll go ahead and read it off and then kind of uh, talk about it a little bit more. But the plus one strategy comes from Universal Design for Learning Principles, which unfortunately uh, today we don't have time to get into, um, but we do have uh, a lot of resources about them and we're always happy to talk about universal design. It's just a way of making our classes more accessible from the beginning for all of our learners, regardless of their backgrounds, their disability status, whatever they're coming in with, we're trying to make our classrooms more accessible for them. So the plus one strategy asks us, is there just one more way that you can help keep learners on task, one more way that you could give them information, or one more way that they could demonstrate their skills? So this is a very um, kind of uh, maybe easier to digest form of all of these strategies and all of these things that we've been talking about. What we're asking you to do or what we're suggesting is that maybe you just think of one thing that you want to do this semester, one thing that you want to change, one way that you want to try to keep your learners on task, one more uh, resource or one more reading that you want to add, just adding one thing to your syllabus to make it more equitable or inclusive. And by doing this over the course of a few semesters, you will build up a much more equitable and inclusive classroom in a way that feels manageable to you as an instructor. Trying to do all of these things at once in one class, if you've never done them before, can feel entirely and completely overwhelming in a very understandable way. 
So we want to offer you this strategy as a way of uh, moving towards where you want to be, but knowing that you don't have to do it all at once. It's okay to uh, not be perfect all at once in the same way that our students aren't perfect. We're also not perfect as instructors. So with that, um, we'll move to our final reflection, which is basically applying this plus one strategy. So what is one strategy you plan to apply to make your teaching more effective, engaging, and or equitable this semester? You can feel free to uh, share that in the chat or uh, I think just share in the chat now, uh, given our timing. Yeah, and I think while while people are thinking about that and sharing their ideas in the chat, we're going to spend the last few minutes going over our services and resources so that you all are aware of how else you might connect with us throughout the semester. Um, so we offer a combination of services and resources between consultations, events and workshops, and online resources. So we'll talk a little bit about each of these really quickly. Um, Shed, do you want to talk about our teaching and learning services? Absolutely. So um, we offer, so here's two of our services that we offer. The first is consultations. So uh, whatever sort of topic around teaching you would like to explore, talk about one of us, talk about with one of us more, we're really happy to set time um, to have those conversations with you. And it's not a one-time thing. You can come back to us as many times as we can be helpful for you in consultation. So you might explore topics like course design, syllabus design, instructional strategies to use in the classroom, uh, gathering feedback on your teaching, um, building a teaching portfolio, uh, which is going to be really important um, for a lot of us. And then we've got mid-semester course analyses, which we offer every semester, um, which is when we come into your class, we facilitate a conversation with your students to gather and compile formative feedback on your teaching. We then meet with you to discuss results and possible changes. So rather than just waiting till the end of the semester to get feedback, we come in mid-semester to your class um, and we uh, talk to your students and then create a report which we review with you to talk about what did your students share? What are they liking about the class? What's helping them learn? What could be improved to help them learn even more? Um, and so you will get an email uh, in a couple weeks uh, sharing this service with a form to fill out to request the service as well. And Mac has also shared our stable links for those. Is this one me? No. Okay, sorry. Go ahead, Ray Kevin. Um, sorry, I uh, am dealing with a bit of a crisis in my apartment. We're having some leaks, but um, I just wanted to highlight here the um, that we do have longer series of workshops throughout the year. The one coming up next is the Ann Farron Conference. That's happening this week on Thursday and Friday. Um, hopefully some of you have signed up, but if not, um, maybe someone can drop a link in the chat to that sign up. It's all faculty present presenters. Um, actually a few people here, uh, a few of the CTRL people are presenting too, but um, it's uh, all virtual on Thursday and then hybrid on Friday. And if you're in person, there's a lunch and a dessert reception. Um, we also have a number of workshops throughout the semester and we have um, an events page on our website that Mac just also posted in the chat. So both of those links will take you to our events. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to highlight right now is our Course Design Institute. I believe the next one is happening in May, is that right? Um, but it's a four part series um, where you redesign the goals of your course, think about um, making everything student-centered and aligned with these practices that we've been talking about, DIEJ spectrum, UDL, um, all that good stuff. It's a great time to really dive in to your syllabus. Um, yes, so the next iteration will be during the, the May faculty workshops. We go into general frameworks, um, learning outcomes and assessments, formative assessments and grading practices, and then end with that student-centered learning environment that we can create in our classrooms. Um, Mac, did you want to add anything to that? I think you covered it great. Thanks, Mary Catherine. And, and Hannah? 
Yeah, and I'll close us out with just letting you know that we have, as we've been dropping in the chat, plenty of online resources too for you to engage in on your own time. So we have a syllabus guide with a downloadable syllabus template, which is really helpful as a first time instructor. Uh, we shared before about our student partners and their insights and projects. So I encourage you to look through those. Uh, the CTRLB is um, faculty, student, and staff publications. So short essays, um, some more informal writing about teaching and learning from personal perspectives, and also guides if you are developing a teaching portfolio. Um, and then we have lots and lots of resources on all topics related to teaching, like accessibility, course design, and different strategies like we've been popping into the chat. Um, so I know we're we're just a minute over and it's a long and late night that I'm sure you're you're looking forward to winding down from. Um, so we really want to thank you for being here. Thank you for taking the time to join us and for engaging with each other, especially in those breakout rooms. Uh, like we said before, you can request a consult at any time. We hope to see you at our upcoming events. And um, again, thank you. And then to the person who asked, I think it was Julie, who asked where the recording will be. Um, it will be posted. You'll get an email with it, um, but it will also be posted on our archive, which I just added the link to as well. And I know there's a there's a ton of links in the chat. Um, don't feel like you have to open all of them. They are all linked in the titles of those uh, resources that we shared. So when you get the PowerPoint, you'll be able to just click on those and uh, access those resources. Nice to meet y'all. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. And if anybody's got any additional questions, you can feel free to. Uh,